Um, so, but I'm really excited to be with you guys this morning. Um, what I kind of wanted to start by talking about um, is actually Christmas. And I know that a lot of us are like, well, we just did Christmas. I unwrapped all my presents. Christmas is over. Um, well, in the spirit of Sam Hubbard, who likes to be a rule breaker, I'm going to try to be a rule breaker um, and continue talking about Christmas even after we've opened the presents. Um, and, uh, and before I get on that soapbox about how Christmas really isn't over, um, the other thing that I kind of wanted to start with is uh, my own personal frustrations with myself about this Christmas, because I don't know about you, but I've had a few of my own little misadventures this Christmas. Um, and the first one is that there were many presents that I had these grand visions of creating for people that didn't actually get done. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm like, okay, people are still out of town. Maybe I can finish their Christmas presents. Um, and so I'm like, okay, well, I didn't finish those. Um, and, and it's funny because the more that I think about it, I think in my mind I get this idea that people have these like really perfect Christmases that just happen very seamlessly and smoothly. And I think about some of my own Christmas experiences and I'm like, mm, uh, I don't know if it always really happens like that. Like I didn't finish my presents. Um, that's one thing. You know, but I, I envision these people, and um, I have a picture for you, and you can throw it up there for me. Uh, and the, this is kind of what I picture these people being like. You know, like I picture the Christmas where everybody's wearing, like, their matching, you know, onesie outfit, you know, and they have maybe some festive cookies on a platter that weren't burnt. You know what I mean? You know, they, they wrapped beautiful presents. They didn't cut the paper too short and have to add in a part after have you ever done that? You know, that's, oh, it's such a pet peeve of mine. I'll be hurrying through the wrapping, and I'll cut the paper too short, and then I'm like, do I really want to cut another piece of paper that's so wasteful? So then I just put another piece on top of it, and it looks, you, you know what it looks like. It just doesn't look that great. You know, but I envision that there are these people that have these Christmases that they're the perfect Christmas presents. They buy the right sizes. They don't forget to buy people Christmas presents. You know, I, I picture them getting to church on time on Christmas Eve. You know, and you know on Christmas Eve, getting to church on time is getting to church early. So if you already have trouble getting places early on Christmas Eve, it's really that much harder because you have to be earlier than early to actually get a seat. Do you know what I'm talking about? My family is notorious for being late to Christmas Eve service every single year. And we always get there in just the amount of time to be able to sit outside of the sanctuary and to kind of like listen really hard and see if like maybe we can uh, hear the service. I've start, I started bringing my own Bible because I just planned on not being able to hear what, what the preacher was saying, you know. So I was like, I'm just going to have a little time back here while you guys enjoy church inside, you know. So I just think of my life and my family and things have never gone exactly as planned. But in my mind, I don't know why, I have this vision that, that it happens for people that they go home after the Christmas Eve service and they play board games and they laugh and nobody gets mad at each other or too competitive with each other, you know? And then they sit by the fireplace and have these really deep conversations about the meaning of life. Isn't that what happens for everyone on Christmas Eve? No, I know, but I think that it does. And so my, in my mind, I'm like, Things didn't go the way they're supposed to. There's all these misadventures at Christmas. Um, and my newest one this year, this Christmas was a little, a little bit different for me. Um, ever since I was born, practically, on Christmas Eve, we go to a Christmas Eve party with my cousins. I have tons of cousins, um, and so it's always really a highlight for me. And we play some white elephant game, and it's really silly. And, and I just, that's, that's my tradition. That's what I'm used to. Um, that's what I love. And so this year we had a youth service, which was awesome. And I loved it. Um, and in my mind, I was like, well, I'm just going to get in the car and I'm going to drive to Lake Charles, which is three hours away, and I'm going to get there. You know, it's going to be just like old times, and it's going to be great. You know, but by the time I get in my car and I drive, and I'm about two hours into this journey, and I'm like looking at my clock, and I'm like, I don't know if everyone's still going to be there by the time that I get there. Um, they might have all left already. It's going to be almost 8.30. And uh, my cousins have babies now, and they have other families to go and visit. And I'm like, I probably should just go back to Lafayette. And so, you know, I, <laughs> I go, and I get there, and I talk to my mom on the phone. And I think everything's cool, but then I talk to her, and I'm like, 
oh yeah, I guess I'm not gonna make it. I'm just gonna go home. I gotta get off the phone now. <laughs> and so I go home, you know, and I walk in the door and it's empty. And there's my mom's cats. And I'm wearing my mom's old tacky Christmas sweater. And then I was hoping to be able to get the great food. I was like counting on getting the great food at this Christmas Eve party. So I didn't stop to get any food. And so I get there and I look in the refrigerator and all I could find was frozen tamales. Because apparently, guys, when you grow up and you move away from your parents' house, they don't cook as much. So there's not as much food around. It's a bummer. And so there was, you know, so I, I, I was sitting there feeling kind of sorry for myself, you know, thinking, this is a vision of my future. I'm, I'm alone on Christmas Eve and I'm wearing my mom's tacky Christmas sweater and I'm, all I have is the cats. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, you know, just, just really wallowing in it. I'm like, I guess I'll watch a Christmas movie. You know, and I, I try to find Elf. It brightens the mood a little bit. Um, and it was funny, and it's funny how God works, um, because right, right then when I'm like, everyone should feel bad for me, this is, this is horrible. Right at that moment, my friend Christine happens to send me a message on Facebook, and it's this blog, um, and I'm going to read you a little part of this blog, because this is what I, what I started to read in the midst of my self-pity about how horrible my Christmas was going. Um, and it said, and this is a woman in her blog, and she's writing, and she says, I'm getting a divorce. She whispered it, her voice cracking under the weight of what that sentence held. She could barely contain the sob that followed. It's a week before Christmas, and her family is broken. I watched a funeral procession go by today. There were dozens of cars following the hearse and two limos. Obviously, someone who was well-loved and valued in this life was being laid to rest today, a week before Christmas. That family will never be the same. Their Christmas is broken. It's been 19 months since Emma died. She was only 15. Her parents are experiencing yet another broken Christmas. There's no getting around it. The family table is missing someone. Time does not heal all wounds. Christmas is broken. In Peshawar, Pakistan, hundreds of families are burying their children today, mourning, wailing, scars that will never heal, trauma that is too painful to relive, fear, Jesus come quickly, broken, so broken. And she goes on, and then kind of after she goes on with more and more of these examples, she said, it would be nice to say Merry Christmas and be completely oblivious to the world around us, but that would be lying. The fact is, more of us are broken at Christmas than whole. And, you know, in the midst of my, my little pity party, my friend Christine sends me this, and I'm like, really? I really just wanted to sit here in, in my, you know, Taggy Christmas sweater feeling bad. And then I really started to think about it. And I, I was like, you know, it, it really is true. You know, for a lot of us, we have this vision that Christmas is this magical day, but life doesn't stop. The world doesn't stop. You know, and, and I began to think about all the things that, that are going on in the world. And I, <laughs> and I think that for the first time, not for the first time, but one of many times, um, I realized some of my own entitlement mentality, that mentality that, like, I deserve for things to go well. Do you know th those thoughts? You know, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, I deserve to have Christmas that goes perfectly. I deserve to have my family all around. I deserve to have delicious food, more delicious food than on a normal day on Christmas. I deserve you know, to, for it to go so well and to be so magical and be so perfect. You know, and, and I, realized, I re realized my own thinking when I was sitting there and after I read part of this, you know, and realized, you know, why? Like, why? You know, and, and this little sarcastic voice came into my head and said, yeah, because that's what Christmas is all about, right? Things going smoothly, just to cater to your comfort to cater to your own personal well-being. Like, that's what Christmas is all about. It's just to be really smooth and comfortable, you know? And, and it, it was kind of sarcastic, and I was wondering, is the spirit sarcastic? Like, does he speak in a sarcastic voice? Because that was really biting, you know? And I kind of laughed about it to myself. Um, but the more I started thinking about it, the more I began to really identify with the Christmas story in a way 
that I haven't on Christmas Eve probably ever. Um, because so many times on Christmas Eve, you know, it's gone the way that I've always sort of envisioned or at least the, the messed up norm in my own house, you know. But when that was gone, for the first time, I, I really felt like, oh, this is, this, is, this, is, this is at the heart of the Christmas story, that things are broken, you know, that things aren't smooth, that there is pain and there is brokenness. That, that is the heart of the Christmas story. It's not about my comfort. It's not about all of those things that I didn't think that I thought it was about. But somewhere along the line, I realized that sometimes I do still think that that's what it's about. Um, and I know, I know for you guys, and, I, and I'm thinking here and thinking about what I was going to share with you guys today, I was like, well, surely it's not just me. You know, surely I'm not the only one that had things that happened at Christmas that weren't exactly how you planned, that weren't what you wanted, um, that weren't the cookie cutter, you know, and, and, and I don't know how many of you were like me and kind of at some point got caught up in like, this is just not the way that it, it was supposed to be. Um, and, you know, and I know for a lot of you guys, and I'm just spitballing here, but I know that there are people that have traveled from house to house to house because your families aren't the same as they used to be. You know, I, I know that there are people here who, you know, maybe there's not someone there this Christmas that used to be there, you know, and, and maybe this Christmas it was more of a reminder of that. Um, I know that there's so much going on. I know that there, you know, my niece was sick this Christmas, and so my brother and sister-in-law couldn't go to the party either because their daughter was sick, you know, and so I know for a lot of you, you know, there are people in your family that have been sick, that are sick, and so maybe Christmas wasn't the same because of that. I know that there are so many things that are going on in this room of people that made your Christmas not perfect too, made your Christmas maybe a little, a little more broken. Um, you know, Christmas talks so much about, you know, peace on earth, and maybe, maybe Christmas for you just was a reminder of how there wasn't a whole lot of peace in your life and in relationships. And maybe there are people that you don't talk to anymore because something went down. You know, maybe there are people you hadn't seen in forever. And so it was just hard to connect because you hadn't talked all year. And so you just felt this disconnect. You know, I, in a room like this, there are so many things that I know that are going on and that have gone on. And not to mention all of the things that are going on outside you know, I know that there's so much that goes on inside of us, too, at Christmas. You know, and, and I know for some of us, maybe, maybe everything on the outside was great, and it went the way that it always does, and it went well. But maybe it was more of you and God. And maybe on the inside, you weren't where you thought you were years ago, or maybe you just felt this disconnect from God, or maybe, maybe there were just inner turmoil for you, and it was God that you felt distant from. Um, and so that made your Christmas a little less broken because you didn't really know whether you believed in all the stuff that you were hearing at church anymore and there were questions and doubt that maybe weren't there before. Um, there's so many things. And, you know, I, as I began to think about all of this and think about the Christmas story, you know, I, again, I was like, but maybe these are the very things that can draw us into the story better than ever before. You know, I know growing up as a child, sometimes we hear the story and it doesn't really mean anything to us, you know, because we can't relate to it. But maybe these things that have caused your Christmas to be a little less than perfect, maybe those are the very things that, are going, that make your Christmas meaningful, that allow you to touch the story with your hand and say, Yes, I relate to this. I, I identify with this. I understand this because I know what brokenness is. Um, I think about the story, and I know we've heard it and we've talked about it, but I, I want you to think about it a little bit anew. You have Mary, right? And we've talked about Mary. You know, you've heard about Mary. She finds out that she's pregnant. She's a young girl. You know, that's probably not a part of her plan. That was a scary time for her. It was scary. Her Christmas was broken. Misadventure number one in the Christmas story. And then there's Joseph, right? You know, he has this woman that he loves, that he trusts, and all of a sudden she's like, well, I'm pregnant. And he freaks out, right? 
you know, misadventure number two. You know, you, it goes on and on. You think about the, the very birth of Jesus. You know, the, the, it says at the beginning of Luke that a census was taken at the beginning at, in, in the land. The Roman government had called for a census, right? And, and what that really means is that Rome wanted to impose much more oppressive taxes on the people. You know, so you've got this economic crisis going on, and then here's Mary who's pregnant, and so now they have to travel a distance to go home. Misadventure number three, who likes to travel when they're pregnant? I've never been pregnant, but it seems horrible, you know? Like, I hear my sister-in-law, you know, she doesn't want to fly, you know, you don't want to drive in a car. Think about, like, riding in a little carriage or on a donkey or however. We know she was with a donkey, you know? And I'm like, that can't be comfortable. And the amount of time that would take, that is not, that's misadventure. You know, that's not comfortable, that's not great. And I think about that story, and then, you know, it goes on and on, right? Jesus is born in a place, you know, the, the second-hand area with the, with the, in the caves with the animals. There was no room. Sorry, no room. That didn't go as planned. And yet that's where Jesus was born. You know, and it was dirty, and there were no midwives there. And can you imagine Joseph being like, oh, you're having a baby. I'm sure he's not medically trained, you know? And so there's Joseph. Talk about misadventures. And it doesn't stop there. Jesus is born, it doesn't stop there. You know, King Herod, he gets a little, you know, paranoid. He hears about this King Jesus. He's afraid he's going to come and take, take his reign. And so he's like, kill all the baby boys. He enacts genocide for little kids, two and under, little boys. And so Mary and Joseph have to flee to Egypt. They become refugees. Misadventure, misadventure, misadventure. It doesn't go the way that they've planned. Christmas is not about things going perfectly. If if anything, Christmas is about something beautiful being born into brokenness. And the crazy thing about brokenness is that if something is broken, there means there's space. And if there's space, that means there's room. And that's all that Jesus needs is room. How many times have we just not given him room to come into our lives? That's why so many times it has to be the broken things that bring us to him because we don't leave him any room. So what if we began to think of all those things that went wrong on Christmas as things that, that went wrong, but actually it went right because it gave Jesus room to do what he wanted to do? There's room there. Um, there's a, a passage in scripture that talks about Jesus, um, and I want to put it up there for us, and we're going to look at it. It's from Isaiah, and um, it, this is the message version. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light, sunbursts of light. You can keep going. And then the next verse says, For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. And the reason that I chose this version was, you know, we often hear this translated as Prince of Peace, which I think is, is wonderful and beautiful, but I think that sometimes we don't have a, a very correct view of what peace actually is. You know, Eugene Peterson used this word wholeness. In the Greek, the word peace, it means shalom, it means completeness. That is what peace is. Peace is not necessarily an absence of conflict, but peace is about wholeness. It's about things being put back together again. That is what peace is. And I think for me, a lot of times, what I thought peace was was this warm, fuzzy feeling that everything is going well, and so I'm peaceful, I'm not stressed, I'm not anxious, I'm not burdened. But that's not necessarily what peace is. Peace is about wholeness. And so it says that Jesus was the prince of wholeness. And so imagine that, that you have this very broken situation that Jesus is being born into, and, they, and one of his names is Prince of Wholeness? How perfect is that? The Prince of Wholeness comes in to the land of brokenness. It just makes sense. And that is who Jesus is. Um, 
And, and I guess my, my question for myself and my question for us, um, this season and, and as the, year, the new year begins, is have we allowed the Prince of Wholeness to come into the broken areas of our lives? Have we allowed that? Um, you know, I, I like to think about, you know, this part of the message being sort of like the brainstorming part, um, because this is really about you and about me and what we're going to do about it. You know, we can sit here and say like, yeah, my Christmas was broken, there were things that didn't go as planned, but then we have this beautiful truth that Jesus is the Prince of Wholeness, so what does that mean for us? Um, and I have a few ideas, but I'm going to need you to be thinking along with me. Um, you know, one of them that I think about is maybe our response to Jesus being the Prince of Wholeness is in those areas of our lives where there's brokenness, in those relationships that there's brokenness, maybe it's time for us to take a step towards reconciliation and restoration. Um, you know, I think that peace is not something that is, peace is active. We say that love is active. Well, so is peace. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt has this awesome quote that I'll have them put up. Um, and it says, it isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it. Peace is not something that's just going to happen. It's not. Peace is something that we have to pray about and then take a step towards. It's something that we work at. You know, and so maybe, maybe this, this Christmas, that's what you're moving towards, is saying, how can I, in my relationships, work towards restoration? And it doesn't mean that full restoration will happen immediately, that full reconciliation will but it may mean that you make a phone call that you've been putting off just to say hi. You know, it may mean having some conversations that are hard. You know, I, I think that Jesus paves the way and shows us what it looks like in relationships to work towards peace. And, and, and the way that he did it was humility and sacrifice. He came as a baby. He came meek and humble and naked and so, so many times, peace is about humility and sacrifice and vulnerability, and that's how we move towards it. Humility and sacrifice pave the way to rest restoration. And so maybe that's part of your response, is, is to begin thinking on that. Maybe for you, it's, you've, you've been able to identify something in your world that's broken. Maybe it's an institution. Maybe it's something in our community and you see a gap there. Maybe it's our church and you see a need there. Well, be, being someone who follows the Prince of Wholeness, what that means for you is that maybe you're stepping into these places that are broken and you are helping to put them back together again. How are you taking action to put them back together again? You know, the church is supposed to be this really creative agent in the world to bring about restoration. Is there a way for you to be a part of that in the church? That could be your response. You know, and, but maybe, maybe for you it's not all of those things. Maybe for you this Christmas it's about realizing that the Prince of Wholeness has come for you and has come for the places inside of you that are broken, that has come for you in the midst of your depression, that has come for you in the midst of your despair or your brokenness or your shame or your guilt. Maybe he's come for you in the midst of your, your feeling like, I can never get it right. Maybe he's just come for you and your soul. I know he's come for you. And so maybe this Christmas, it's about praying for God to bring wholeness and restoration in your life. You know, Jesus is the only thing that will ever bring peace and salvation and, and balm to your hurting soul. And so maybe for you, that's what it's about. Um, but I... I I don't want you to let Christmas pass you by and not think, wow, there are responses. I don't want you to think that your Christmas was broken and then just move on and miss the amazing and joyful and wonderful reality and truth that your brokenness is the very way that Jesus wants to act in your life. Um, and so the band is going to come up and we're going to play some music, um, but I want to challenge you. Um, I want to challenge you to, if, it, if, it you, if it's you that needs wholeness, I challenge you 
to pray. I challenge you to seek someone out in this congregation, whether it be me or a friend or someone you came with, and ask them to pray for you. You know, if it's something in your life that is broken, I challenge you to pray, to seek prayer. Don't be afraid to go and stand outside if that's your response. Um, And so we're going to continue in worship, and I'm going to pray for us. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for each person that's in this room. God, I know that it's not an accident. Father, I know that you have something specific to say to every single one of us. Father, and I know a lot of us think that maybe we missed Christmas because of all the busyness and that the moment has passed. But I know that the moment is never past and that you always desire to come for us. God, that you decided 2,000 years ago to come for us and that you came in meekness and humility and sacrifice. And so, Father, I pray that you would come to us this, this morning. Father, I pray that you would come into the relationships that have been broken, places where there have been deep hurt. Father, we acknowledge those places, Father, but I pray that today would be, would be the beginning of restoration and healing that you really are a God that can change things and that can make things whole again. God, that we don't have to just sing about it and, and wish for it, but we can, that we can believe and we can claim that it's true and that today is the beginning of that. Father, I pray that you would speak to us loud and clear. We love you. We open our broken lives to you and ask you to come in. We proclaim that there's room. There's room for you. We need you. We love you. Amen.